All right, welcome everybody. Today we're having a special presentation on a subject that comes up often, you know, through uh, members of my team and with agents that, you know, I work with, which is what do I do with a mobile home? And usually, it, it, I mean, obviously it would involve either you have somebody that wants to buy a mobile home and or you have somebody that wants to sell a mobile home. And sometimes we have something going on right now where they're selling one mobile home to buy another mobile home. And so there is a difference in the way mobile homes work and the way you find them and what you're looking for and the way the offer is written and the way the listing is taken. And the big difference, of course, is the lending side of a mobile home loan. And that's why I have invited Dennis Martin um, who we're posting, my, my efficient director of administration is posting your contact information in, in the <laughs> chat. Um, and so Dennis does mobile home loans and has for a long time. And what, where, what, what you're going to find out is that most of the lenders that you guys can name, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, Golden One, Credit Union, most of those, all of those lenders, uh, they don't do mobile home loans, right? And the loan is different and the, the lenders are different. And so we're going to hear from somebody who, you know, actually knows what they're actually knows. So one of the things to start with, for those of you that are a analytical inquisitive type, which I know all of you are, right? That's why you, you come to these sessions. The California Association of Realtors has a section called Legal Q&As, right? Which I'm sure you've all got bookmarked and you go there often, right? Isn't that, isn't that right? And one of them, if you notice, they have a mobile homes folder. Oh my gosh. And what do they have in the mobile homes folder? Well, they really just have one article called Mobile Homes. And it is a 2019 article written by the lawyers at the California Department of Real Estate. And they even talk about things like rent control and all sorts of different things that are of a legal nature, which we're probably not going to get into, right? I don't know, maybe. The other thing that I want to point out is, let's say you're looking for, um, you're representing a buyer. And this also becomes important when you're looking for um, comparables to run for a CMA. And if you're looking, and not everybody is in the land of matrix, which is the program that I use, but if you go up to search and you go to mobile home, you will start to see the search for mobile homes. And if you're looking for active and notice you get the choices, single wide, double wide, triple wide, quad, floating mobile homes. I don't, you know, I don't have any, I've never you know, worked with one of those. Um, but if your client is very specific, right, they want a triple or a quad or whatever, then um, that would be, you know, I'm not going to pay attention to the chat for a while. Uh, that way you would click on it bedrooms, bathrooms, and that sort of thing. Now, as a, um, a tip, Zillow, Redfin, and Realtor.com don't do as well with mobile homes, right? In terms of their ability to search, they just don't seem to do as well. And even RPR, which we oftentimes use to run comparables, don't do well with mobile homes. And so once you've done the search, notice some of the, I only have a few things listed in my personal mobile home search, but you can add fields. And the most common fields that you're going to want to add is this field that deals with restrictions. And the restrictions could be, you have to be a certain age, right? You have to be 65 or older or 55 or older. I can't even get into those mobile homes because they check your ID at the gate. Did you guys know that? <laughs> And so I haven't ever even, well, anyhow. Um, and then notice some of them say one resident is 55 plus height restrictions. I guess if you're too tall, they don't want you. Well, that may not be it actually. But um, anyhow, you can see that there's a lot of different restrictions. Now, just as a tip, listing agents aren't always good and accurate at putting in the correct information. I'm just warning you. 
right? Um, they're not always good and accurate. And so if it says there's no restrictions, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no restrictions. And um, if it says 55 plus, it could be only one needs to be 55 plus. Um, so age of the mobile home, garage spaces, space rent, those are some. Are there any other, uh, Dennis, that you would recommend adding that if you were searching to buy one? No, the big one I look for is age of the home because of the differences, if it's a pre-HUD or a post-HUD built home, which we'll get into in a moment, but it's basically 1976 was the the year where ch things changed dramatically. And that changes whether you can get financing at all and what kind of financing it occurs. I was gonna comment back on the single wide, double wide, triple wide type of comment as well. As you said, I, I see those things marked or not marked by listing agents incorrectly all the time. Yeah. Um, they're just, and especially if it's going to be getting pulled in from another listing group, right? If it's coming in from Metro List or something, it, it those don't translate well, right? Sometimes you have to just go look at it. Yeah, and <laughs> um, so I, are there any questions? I mean, other than that, it's kind of the same. Now, when I'm doing comparables for a mobile home, so let's say you have a mobile home listing and you're going to do a comparable. I've been doing these recently. And what I tip, like the one I was doing for an agent that I work with was in Redwood City. There's only really one mobile home park in Redwood City. But if you know the address of the, of the unit that you're doing, the, the mobile home park address, and you go to the map search, put in a quarter of a mile, paste in the address, and then I usually just go down here and say zero minus 90 for status change date. And I look at all of them, right? And um, again, I don't know the address right off the top of my head of one, but what that's going to do is give you for the last 90 days, everything that has happened in that mobile home park, which, which is active, contingent, pending, sold, withdrawn, it's everything. And the reason you, as I said, it's much more difficult to do comps on a mobile home because first of all, it's, they're not all the same, right? This is not like a tract house in the subdivision where there's a certain model and they're all the same. And because the, 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 the quality, the age, the location, all of that has to do, but that would be a way for you to full, pull up all of the active pending recent sales, those that didn't sell that are in a particular mobile home complex so that you could do a comp analysis to figure out what it might be worth. Do not expect RPR to be accurate. Don't expect Redfin, Zillow, Realtor.com's automated valuation models to be accurate, not on mobile homes, All right? Much less likely. Yeah, I would say on that, on, you're looking at the comps. One of the things I've noticed over the years of looking at these things is that the a lot of these homes, as they get older, they get updated, or, you know, and that makes a big difference in the valuation. If it's just a, a home that was built in 1990, but was never updated, and it looks like an old mobile home or manufactured home, the value is quite a bit less. So the the way it's if it's been updated, it makes a huge difference in establishing the value. And the appraisers tend to take that into account as well. Yeah. All right. Any questions from our group so far? Are you all having a cool? I guess I, uh, right. that, that, that is another thing that you'll find on Zillow or Realtor.com, these guys. Um, when they pull the information in, they'll show zero HOA, and that's very rarely correct um, because they don't pull over the space rent as an HOA. They're different, right? But from a, if you're sitting there and you're doing a search, somebody buyer is doing a search on Zillow, they say, "Oh, well, there's no space. There's no there's no HOA. Well, there's no HOA, but there is a space rent." It's possible sometimes there's both, but not mm -hmm. all. So what would be, um, so wouldn't the lowest space rent be better, more desirable? If you're mm -hmm. representing a buyer, is the, 
are we looking for the the parts with the lowest rent? Space rent is huge. It's huge. And it's huge. In what I, terms? Go ahead, Debbie. Well, in our area, um, it can be as a lie as high as eleven hundred. Um, and it's very rare to find a 500. So for in our area, uh, 500 to 1100 per month just for space rent is pretty huge. Right. So, um, sorry to interrupt, this is Ken. If you go over to Santa, Santa Cruz County, getting near the water, you're mm -hmm. talking about 2000, sometimes even $3,000 a month space rent. Yep. One of the things that I learned the hard way working with buyers is not to necessarily assume that the way I look at things is the way they look at things. So, for example, if we were to analyze what the buyer's dominant buying motives are and what are they looking for in a mobile home park, what I've noticed is, is that the mobile home parks that are the cleanest, the best run, that have the most amenities, the most stuff going on, have the highest space rent. Right? And the ones that are the not so nice, not well maintained, not necessarily that clean, and don't have stuff, they have the lower space rents. That's just been my and so if if rather than saying, ooh, that's too high. I would be finding out, well, what is important to you in the mobile home park? And if they say, well, I want the gym and I want the social groups and I want the, the you know, the community center and I want the pool and I want it to be clean and I want it to be secure and I want, well, yeah, you're going to have a higher space rent, right? Which, of course, is going to come up in financing. That's my, my two cents about that. Well, the other thing you're start, we're starting to see more and more of is these space rents uh, are coming under rent control. And so that can be an advantage in some areas like around here where we've seen space rents just jump up dramatically. If you're buying, it can help you. Um, we're going to see, let's see if we've got, please comment um, here. Let me, let me look at some of our questions. AV Core doesn't do, uh, yeah, I know, nobody does. IDX is not good on mobile homes income. We'll talk about income requirements. What's the difference between a mobile home and a manufactured home? Khalid asks, this is a good question. I've heard this before. Are they the same thing? Now, we tend to use the terms interchangeably. Um, I think technically, if you were to look at it, the manufacturer, the mobile homes, are ones that are built like to an RV standard. So like your RVs that you see rolling down the street or a mobile home, but also the ones that were built prior to June 15th, 1976, which is when housing and urban development stepped in and set a, some standards for manufacturing. And that, be, so ones that are older than manufacture date prior to June 15, 1976, typically are considered mobile homes. More recent ones are manufactured homes, but honestly, uh, the terms are used interchangeably. Right. And even there's a mobile home slash manufactured home transfer disclosure statement provided by the California Association of Realtors. They throw them together. Um, at one time, mobile homes were, well, mobile. You know, we, we called them trailers, actually. And mm -hmm. you even had a little tiny, you know, miniature, a, a mini dry, a license plate that you could put on it and take it down the road. But they're not mobile anymore. And I, I forget exactly what the exact number is, but 95, 97% of the time when a mobile home is put on a, in a park, it never moves. And just for you guys to understand, I, mean, I should have mentioned this, as a real estate licensee, it is legal for you to sell a used mobile home, but you cannot sell a new mobile home. And what I mean by a new mobile home is one that has not been registered with the Department of Housing and Community Development. In other words, it's on a mobile home lot. And if you want to sell those, you have to have a mobile home dealer's license. But when, when is a new car 
a used car? And the answer is the moment you drive it off the lot, right? As soon as you hit the street, you now have a used car. So as soon as the mobile home has been moved into a park, and I believe the, the code says it has to be in a place where it could remain for at least one year. At that point, it's real estate agents can sell it, right? And a manufactured home is a little more accurate because they're not that mobile, right? I mean, you don't see them going down the freeway except to be going to the, the park in the first place. And manufactured homes sometimes are, are put on foundations. There's also modular homes. This would be a, a fun class to do. Manufactured, mobile, modular. Um, mm -hmm. What is the difference between a duet, a duplex, uh, something like that later? Is there a HOA on mobile homes and comments on space rent? I think we've already done that. Uh, we're going to get to rates in a moment, not necessarily a mortgage plus space rent. Why don't you, since they're eager to hear about this, um, do you want to give a little rundown? Because we, we don't really have, unless your slides, were your slides something that had the rundown? Should I pull them up or? Yeah, we can we can go through that. All right. So Unless you uh, wanted to go through the listing agreement. All right, we could do that first. Let me. And then we can uh, roll through my stuff and I could probably answer most of the questions that are popping up. Yeah. What I, I'm going to need to do is to get, um, if my, if Ra is listening, um, if you could paste the link to the handout, if you haven't already done so, into the chat, that would be awesome because it's going to take me a long time to find it. Um, oh, and she said she already did. So anyhow, she's way more efficient than I. Let's start with <laughs> listing a mobile home. Let's start with that, right? Why not? And you're going to know notice that you start, if you're going to list a mobile home, with the standard residential listing agreement, exclusive, right? That's where you're going to start. They used to have a mobile home listing agreement. They got rid of that a while ago. And so there's nothing to see that's any different here, nothing to see here, nothing to see here, right? But then when we get to the residential listing agreement, you're gonna see here, it says this property is a manufactured parentheses mobile home and see the manufactured home listing addendum for additional terms. So when you click this box, what's going to happen is it, it, it being the zip form software will automatically load the manufactured home listing addendum. And this addendum pretty much mirrors all the specific parts of what was in the mobile home listing agreement and very much the same kind of parts that were in the um, purchase agreement with the mobile home addendum. One comment that we were talking about before that I wanted to maybe clarify, because I learned something today also, um, is one of the things that you'll see when you're filling out the residential listing agreement is the assessor's parcel number. You see that? That's a standard field in the listing. Now, if this is a mobile home in a mobile home park, then the unit does not have a parcel number. But Dennis, maybe you could explain what would a listing agent want to put in there and why? Sure. So what we wind up doing when you're you, when they have a lender involved is the lender wants to verify and take a look at the park management and who's who owns the park. And so by putting that APN in, we oftentimes have to submit the APN number for the park, because it's going to be one APN, to the lender who then looks at and determines whether or not they want to make actually make a loan in that park, because they don't want to loan into an environment where they're likely to be in foreclosure or soon to be in foreclosure, they're in default on their taxes, et cetera, because it can cause huge amounts of problems for them should they have to go into a repossession. We've traditional housing, we call it a foreclosure, but in there in this event is a chattel loan, it's a repossession. And that so that's why that APN number is useful. If you don't provide it, it's not a deal killer for a lender. We know how to look them up as well. Yeah. But if you're wondering, you know, what should I do there and you want to put something in, put in the parks APN. 
So it's like, you know, we're mm -hmm. Dennis is going to talk about the loans, but this is more like a car loan or a boat loan mm -hmm. than it is a house loan. Repossession, because you see, when you go to work, they send the guys over to move the mobile home. Well, anyhow, not quite. But, <laughs> uh, so this is what the addendum looks like. The beginning of it is, you know, just the same stuff. This is a residential listing agreement. You fill it out. And then type of manufactured home, personal property manufactured. And notice it says, pick one, right? Only <laughs> real estate agents need this kind of advice. Only pick one. Right? Don't try and click all the boxes. So usually what we're clicking is the first one. Right? Right. This is the most common. It's in a park on rented land and you're buying it. Right? That's the, that's the, or you're selling it in this case. Space number, park name, park address, city, county, zip. Um, if it's a manufactured home to be sold with real property, this means that somebody modular homes, manufactured homes, somebody buys land, they put a foundation, they put in the manufactured home, they get a certificate of occupancy, they're good to go. And notice they would have their own assessor's parcel number. So if this was, and we don't get a lot of those, I'm not saying maybe where some of you are, but we don't get a lot of those. But if you were selling a land with a manufactured home on it, the assessor's parcel number would be the one for that. And then they break down the manufactured home versus real property. Why would they want to split those two, Dennis? You? Well, I, I think it, it's going to occur when you have a manufactured home that's not been converted to real property, and yet it goes with the land. They're selling a package, a deal, right? Right. Yeah. Because you can have a manufactured home just set in place on its jacks and people living in it, but it's not on a hard foundation. Or if it is, somebody never bothered to do the conversion. Is there a sales tax on the sale of a mobile home? Uh, there is when it's first sold. First sold, right. But not, so, not, as, a, not as a resale tax. Right. But in this case, this could be the first sale of the mobile home, right? It, it could be, yes. A manufactured home, right. Yeah. And so, in other words, there is sometimes a difference. And do, do the lenders care how much? I, would you, I assume you could get a package loan. Yes. Right. right yeah. Where they would lend you money on the real property and lend you money on the personal property. But are the, the rates might be different and the terms might be, right? But maybe not. Not if it's a package. But Oops. anyhow. It's there are reasons why they would like you to break it down as to how, but this is not a common thing. If it's already on the real property, certificate of occupancy, all that other kind of stuff affixed to a foundation, that's what you would collect. But this is normally what we're doing when we list it. Additional description, manufacturer's name, model, date of manufacture, date of first sale. So the seller says, I don't know any of this. How would they, how would they find out? Oh boy, uh, that's good. I can't. What? Oh, I said the title company. Title company, this is not a, um, a title. The title company do doesn't have records of mobile home um, sales. So, well, there's a, there is a title document and we right. do do a title search. And so, but it's done through HCD. It's not done through your county. So the title actually, there is a title paperwork that will have this information on it. Right. So first of all, they should have a piece of paper when they bought it that has this information. And HCD mm -hmm. stands for the Department of Housing and Community Development, which is the state agency overseeing mobile home sales. And it's that is the certificate of title that you get when you buy a mobile home or give when you sell a mobile home is registered with the Department of Housing and Community Development. And most title companies search county recorded records, not the Department of Housing and Community Development, but but you can anybody can do that, right? Um, is the property of the local tax roll? Probably not. Annual registration and in lieu of tax sales or use tax may apply. 
property shall register housing community development, must be notified upon sale, approximate width, length, and expando size. I, I don't really have much to add with any of that part. Mm -hmm. um, there's a HCD HUD license slash decal number, which is different from the serial numbers and apparently is different from the label insignia. What's all, you know, what's what's all that about? Uh, to be honest with you, that seems like, I believe that's on the title document that we it, typically get. It's supposed to be, at least. It's, so, yeah, it's typically there. Just as an example, so let's look at, is this our listing? I don't know, it could be. Uh, no, it's not, but anyhow, it doesn't really matter. You're going to see that some listings down here have a lot of that information, right? Mm -hmm. Some do, some don't, right? It's, it's, it's information you could survive listing without having all of it, but mm -hmm. you'll see that some have more than, than others if you just keep looking at listings. Again, that should be on the title document, but that's one of the things we would get the seller to you know give to us. Um, so we can fill out the form. And then that's pretty much that's pretty much the form. Right, for the listing. The rest of it is just the standard residential listing agreement, right? With that addendum added to it. Um, the other thing that we would do, do you get an SPQ on a manufactured home? A seller property questionnaire? Oh, uh, typically I see them in the packages. It's not relevant for me as a lender, right? but it's pretty common to see them. Right, so I was, let me just hit that part, all right? And hopefully this isn't gonna turn into the blue screen of death. Yeah. All right, so let's say we are going to do, we're gonna buy a mobile home. Right, so we, we open up the residential purchase agreement, the same one you're used to, and we scroll, 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 scroll. Everything, you know, everything looks the same, same old stuff, same grid. Now there's some different boxes and things like that that, you know, you don't check. For example, how about, is there a county transfer tax on a mobile home? The dollar ten per thousand? No. No. City transfer tax on a mobile home. Mm, I've never seen it. I I believe the answer is also no. So yeah, I, um, I'm, I, in the cities I've dealt with, I have never seen it pop up. Is there title insurance on the sale of a mobile home? Nope. No. Is there an escrow fee on the sale yes, of a mobile is. home? Yes, there is. Yeah. Is it the same escrow companies that generally do residential one to four? Uh, that's one of the things I was going to comment on is that some of them have specialized escrow officers specific for this. For example, I do with Old Republic title quite a bit here locally, and they have an office set up in it's not a Walda Creek area right. that that's all they do. So right. you'd have to check with your particular escrow officer. There's others that specifically do it. Your typical residential um, escrow office tip does not handle these. But uh, Chicago, normally they... Mm -hmm. Chicago Title doesn't do mobile homes. A lot of them don't. So the, yeah. then, And the listing agent may have already picked one. But those, no city transfer tax, no county transfer tax, no title insurance, right? Because this isn't mm -hmm. in a real property, but there could be escrow fees. Are the yes. fees similar to the fees mm -hmm. in residential? Yes, they are. And there's a few extra little fees because there's some HCD search fees. There's a title search fee. Um, typically, I tell clients when they're looking to buy bigger, another four to six thousand dollars in closing costs, and that includes a year of taxes and insurance. The, the, the closing costs themselves are not too onerous. All right. 
And then, so the RPA is the same one as the normal one, but there's some things that don't apply. When we get to property type addenda, one of them is called the manufactured home purchase addenda, right? Which um, I have way too many things open. Uh, so let me just go back. I want to say, no, no, but I know I already have it here someplace once it comes back. And then, So there's the, here's the addendum and it's going to look a little familiar. It should. Notice how similar it looks to the listing addendum. Same three choices. Paragraph is the same. There's more terms. There's allocation of costs. Who's going to pay the HCD, Housing and Community Development? Who's going to pay if there's a use tax upon the sale of the mobile home? You can pick whatever you know you you want. Um, there's additional disclosures. It's still kind of the same. Notice it says manufactured home and mobile home transfer disclosure statement. Um, the park rules, uh, residency application. If the property is located on leased or rented land, both buyer's approval of the lease or rental agreement and buyer obtaining residency approval are contingencies. So that's two contingencies. One is the buyer has to approve the park rules. And the second is the park has to approve the buyer. Did you want to add anything about that? Well, I think the... Typically, if they're getting a loan, um, once we have the loan approved, the, the park is the park wants to see the loan approved. But also the park requirements are usually pretty simple. Uh, they want uh, a credit check and then they want a um, an income verification. And typically they want three times gross income for what the, is the space rent and their mortgage payment, taxes and insurance. Three times. So Three times, but that's kind of a soft number because if they, you put more money down, they see that as you're more likely to continue to make the space rent. So it's kind of like, well, it's like rent an apartment. They want to see that you have the ability to continue to make the, the, the space rents because evicted you is a challenge. Yeah. It's, yes, it's a rental, a rental. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I just thought would be useful to mention whatever <laughs> you don't want to know what i thought of the experience and then we're going to be done with the uh we'll talk more about the loans in a second so there's a mobile home manufactured home so the standard rpa says that you're going to provide the buyer a seller property questionnaire. It says that. And it also says that you're going to give the buyer a transfer disclosure statement or a mobile home. Uh, here we go. I knew I did. So this is, this looks, should look fairly familiar but this is the manufactured home transfer disclosure statement, which the reason it's all colorfully blocked out is because the buyer is supposed, I mean, excuse me, the seller is supposed to fill this out. Mm -hmm. The agent does their inspection, the other agent does their inspections. You do an AVID, there are specific questions and you, know, you read your documentation. The... Uh, Go ahead. And just to add on those inspections, one of the things that does occur in a park is the park will go through and inspect the property to verify that it ha is still is has been maintained according to the park standards. Uh, for example, we had one recently where we saw that somebody had built a little gazebo on the back. Well, that wasn't approved by the park, and so it had to be removed prior to the close of sale. The park required that change. Yeah. Would you typically get a property inspection? Uh, typically, we see them, yes. Termite inspection? Uh, yes. Yeah. It's I've, not required by a lender, but I saw often it's pretty common to see them. 
Normally, we would get you would want to get a property inspection. You'd want to get a termite inspection if you're representing a buyer. You'd want mm -hmm. to do that um, because you know you want to know. Notice it says condition of the property. This is the addendum. Notwithstanding, that's a real fun word. That the agreement to which this addendum is attached may provide that the property is sold as is. Buyer and seller acknowledge that sellers not using a licensed real estate agent or a mobile home dealer are prohibited from selling personal property homes as is, unless the manufactured home meets the requirements of the housing and community development. In other words, there are minimum standards that for the sale of a mobile home, because of the, it's like buying even a car that has a manufacturer's defect. All right, even though it, it's not necessarily as it, right? If there's a defect, and the, that that's why the seller is supposed to say anything they know that is wrong. But there's minimum manufacturing construction standards. That's all I got for that. Any questions about that stuff so far? Anyone? Are we? You're all ready to fill out the form. Uh, okay. So let's talk about what everybody really wants to know. I mean, because I know what they really want to know. And what they really would like to understand is, and you can, by the way, can share your screen if you want to okay. do that. Or why don't we do that? So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then you can share your screen. See, we're up to 50 people almost. 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 I'm going to figure out how to get over to the share screen piece. There we go. I've got to do this over here to get be able to see it better. And I could I could show the handout on mine. Also, oh, I've got uh, it. I've got it. All right. Um, I, we were talking just before I go there. I do have a couple slides I wanted to walk through. Right. But we were talking about what a title search looks like. Um, this is a sample of one. We did a couple of years ago, hmm. like a year ago, earlier this year, it looks like. This is a, what a title search would look like. You can get these, usually your escrow company will do them, but your escrow companies, at least I know for Old Republic, which we deal with quite a bit here locally, um, they won't even open escrow until you, they have a deposit. They want a hundred dollar deposit to begin because they do a title search and there's a fees associated with it. Um, but this is what it looks like. Um, you've got what it is, its size, serial numbers, the HUD, you were asking about the HUD labels, and they're listed on here, who the current owner is. Um, I'm not going to talk about one of these things, but HCD manages the ownership title on these properties. Uh, one of the things that is challenging at times is HCD is really backed up on title transfers. So if you get somebody that does a flip, they go in and they buy an older home, manufactured home, they put money into it and get it fixed up nicely. It can take six months for HCD to get the title transferred. And lenders don't like to do double flips. They want to see the registered owner on this piece of paper be the one that signed the contract. There are some lenders that don't care, um, but most lenders don't like that. And so if that's going on in your case, be sure and warn the buyers that they may need to use a lender that allows that. Otherwise, I'd be waiting for three months for the title to get transferred. Can anybody um, search the HCD database to look up this information? You know, I don't really know. I've never did it myself. I've always got it from escrow. All right. But let's say I was listing one and the owner said, I don't got anything. I don't know. I lost all my paperwork. Um, you know, I don't know any of my numbers. Uh, well, certainly the owner can can go go to HCD and make a request for this information. I think it takes a lot longer. Right. The title companies have more direct online access. By title companies, we're not meaning the like Chicago title because I mean we're talking about the escrow company. That no, no, sorry, the escrow person. company. Yes, yeah. because the normal when you say title company to this group, they're thinking of their favorite rep. Who probably yes. doesn't do doesn't do that. Well, and, and it's surprising. So more and more of them are starting to do it. I know Chicago Title doesn't do with them, but I'm seeing more and more pop in and say, "Oh yes, we can do that." 
Yeah, why not? See, and I, the last time I looked, the average price of a manufactured mobile home in San Jose that was for sale was like 285 last time I looked. That sounds and, about right. Yeah, and I, I talked to agents in Arizona and other places because it's sort of something I do. And they're in markets where 300,000 is a single family home. And so we poo poo, you know, the mobile home, you know, it's so cheap. But, but, you know, in, in most of the United States, this would be a decent sale, right? You know, um, is the commissions, do you know, generally the same? It looks like it is now. It used to be higher, I think, when the, the values were lower. But I'm noticing a lot of them, at least on the, Buyer's agent side, there are three, three percent is pretty common. Right. So it's a little higher than what we see. Historically, if we were to say that six percent was the standard commission, mm -hmm. then historically, ten percent would have been a mobile home commission. Right. Historically, right. But it's not always six percent, and it's not always ten. But three percent is more than what a lot of agents are getting on the sale of a house. But right. the but then you know this is not as not as uh, revenue rich as uh, a sale of a no it's not but it is what we found I I know a couple agents that really focus on this marketplace and what they can what they find is that they're consistently busy they don't necessarily have the ups and downs that you see in the traditional market um, because it seems like this business is a little less resistant to those cycles. Cool. Um, let me go through a couple of things here. We talked some about this. So I'm going to flip through them pretty quickly. Uh, chattel, this is, these are basically like a car loan, an RV loan. Uh, and the big difference on those is that they're not attached to the land. We talked about you can make that conversion to real property. The last bullet on here is attached to the land. And then in California, there's a form called a 433 that's filed. With California Housing and Community Development, it changes title such that the property is now within the county records and the county tax base. Okay. Um, and when that happens, um, you can get a traditional loan on it for Fannie, Freddie, pretty much any of your major lenders will do those. It's when they're not attached to the loan permanently that we see um, the need for a manufactured home lender. June 15th, 1976, I put that down here because you're going to run into it from all the time. You see a first-time home buyer coming in and saying, oh, I could buy this house for $100,000 in San Jose. Well, yeah, it's probably a 1970 unit, which may be in great condition, but they're going to have a challenge getting lending on it. Um, we can do loans on them. I have a lender that'll do them. They're 25% down instead of 5%, and the interest rate's a bit higher. Um, let's do down. So who are the chattel loan lenders? Uh, they're not, we've talked about this. They're not the Fannie and the Freddies. They will do the re-property manufactured homes though. So those are great. Uh, the big three that are, I see all the time nationwide are Century 21, Triad, and Credit Human. Uh, these are, they get their funding largely from uh, credit unions. And so a lot of the requirements they have uh, or have been set by the credit unions. Uh, for example, they don't do ITN borrowers because they want a credit union has, has a requirement that the borrower can't be ITN, they must have a social security number. Um, but then there also, there's no automated approval systems. So you get stuff that's it's a more the old school portfolio lenders that we, we were used to when I started into this business over 20 years ago. Um, so you don't get the DU, DOs. So a lot of times what you'll get is a when you see an offer come in, it's important to ask, is this, this pre-qualified or pre-approved? Because we can get the pre-approvals done. It just means that the buyer has to provide all our paperwork and we submit the loan to an underwriter for full underwrite with a given property. And then it can be truly pre-approved versus pre-qualified. And then local community banks come into play. Um, and those largely come into very helpful into some of these parks where the lenders don't want to lend into. I don't have a slide on it, but we talked a little bit about different parks that may not, a lender may not want to touch. Um, 
Lenders can have ask, a real problem, but. Can mm -hmm. I ask a question here? I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. Yeah. I was told several years ago that the only lender in California that will lend on a mobile home pre-1976 is the 21st Mortgage Corporation. Is that true? No, that's not true. Okay. Uh, I know Credit Human will do it. Okay. And you, you, uh, you have people that will do it? Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. I'm, I'm a broker, so I have relationships with these guys. Right. Uh, 21st will do it. Um, but if we want a better deal, we go to Credit Human. <laughs> right, you're going to talk about rates, rates a little contract. bit later, I imagine. A little bit, not okay. much, I mean, because they vary. But um, we'll, 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 I'll be glad to answer questions on that. Um, so okay, what's thanks. it take to qualify? You're welcome. It, what's it take to qualify? Same basic stuff you see in a traditional home, the income assets and credit, right? Can they repay the loan? Do they have enough income to do that? And so the big thing that, buyers forget is space rent. I, 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 I talk to probably several buyers a day and every time they forget, oh yeah, the space rent. How can you forget a thousand dollars a month? Well, but they do. So they, you, the income has to be sufficient. The debt to income requirements, we don't have the niceties of FHA, USDA, these items that allow us to get very high debt to income ratios. Uh, they tend to want Income in the you know gross income thirty five to forty percent of the housing expense. Okay, um, the nice thing about it, the taxes are lower, and I'm going to hit on that in just a moment. Assets five percent down minimum payment. I bet I get this question four times a week. Oh, I don't have any down payment. Can I use one of these down payment assistance programs? And the and the answer is no. Um, I haven't found one yet in California. There may be some local ones that I come across or that cities are offering down payment assistance for mobile homes, but mobile homes and parks typically don't have those. So they're gonna to have to come up with 5%. It's not a huge amount considering the purchase price is 200,000, but it's still 5%. Um, the thing is we can use cash, eh, kinda. If you throw the cash in the bank, there's no seasoning that we have to deal with. It's a little different. Credit scores, so we can go pretty low. We have 600s, I've seen them approved. They say they'll do 575, uh, 600s. But there's some things in there. We do look at um, somebody that has a history of making payments. So if you've got a kid right out of college, they don't have any credit at all, they have one credit card, they just got it, but they've got an excellent score, they don't have a history of making payments. So we're gonna have to do something to um, bring somebody else into the picture to do that um, and somebody else into the purchase. Um, and we also don't look at all three. We just look at one, one of the agencies. Um, Straits, you don't see arms in this market. They tend to be either 20 or 25 years. I know some, uh, 21st will offer a 30 year in some cases. That's kind of an exception, uh, but they will do Typically, it's 20 or 25 year terms. You can get a 30 year term as long as it's going with the land. We talked about that a little bit a moment ago, where you had, we could have a manufactured home on a lot that has never been put on a permanent foundation. We can actually do a package loan transaction. We were doing one the other day that uh, where somebody had purchased a piece of land that was. Um, had a very small home on it. I think it was six, 700 square feet, like in a cabin. And they wanted to put in a large double white. And we were doing the financing on that as a whole package rather than just um, because they needed financing. And we could finance the, the manufactured home as it was being moved on because that was going to be their primary residence. Um, we do have what's called a step rate program. It's a program where the interest rate and payment is lower for the first five years, and then it pops up for the remaining 15. It's a 20 year term total, but it's a preset pop up. So if their interest rate is 8%, say, it would start at like 7.25. And then for the first five years on payment and interest rates fixed for five years, and at the end of five years, it jumps to 8.5 with a payment accordingly. So 
that works pretty well for people that aren't planning on staying there very long, it can help them. Cover that. With 10% or more down, we can roll the closing cost into the loan. Kind of a nice little feature, up to 3% of the purchase price. And there's no MI on these things. Um, the interest rate is higher the less you put down, but that's not unusual anyway, but we have no separate MI to get approved for. Uh, well, this is something I threw in. Um, uh, something I do for people that are doing open houses. If you do have a listing, you want something like that, you can get in contact with me for manufactured homes. Um, it just helps because most of the time when you get a, a listing and you do an open home, I, I've said in these, because I, I have a couple of realtors I help support and I'll go out locally and help them with their open houses. Um, you have people walking in because they see, oh, I can buy a manufactured home. In this case, 239000 in Roseville. Uh, you can't find a single family home or even a condo hardly for that in there. And so then, but they have no idea. And so this gives them a little bit of information about, hey, so 5% is the minimum down, so that's 11995 on this offer. If I do that, what's my payment going to be? What's my taxes? What's my insurance? That sort of thing. So this is useful because most of these people coming in are first time, either first time home buyers, never owned a home, don't understand what to look at. And by the way, they, once again, they always forget this space rent. When you were asking about closing costs, you know, you have your escrow. Um, there's there's a title search, notary fees. Appraisals, yes, we do appraisals. We were talking about that doing your comps. Appraisals, they tend to look at look for homes that are similar size configuration that sold in the same park, ideally, is their ideal. And then they'll expand it out a little bit. But the park is very important in establishing the price. Uh, lender origination fees depends on the lender, what those are going to cost. Um, HCD fees are not much. Personal taxes this is basically the property tax. And sometimes they have the borrower has to pay a, the full next year. So as we go late into the year, uh, HCD requires that they pay the full next year taxes um, as part of the closing cost. I've never seen this thing over two thousand dollars. Property taxes on these things are much less. And then you have the first year insurance. So Danny asks, since most mobile homes are not attached to the land, why is there a property tax? Oh, you that's the next slide. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly why there's a property tax, but HCD imposes a property tax. Um, I think it's kind of it's a carve out somehow the Cal state of California has done. If the proper if these are prior to 1976 homes, you don't have property taxes, you have DMV fees because they're still licensed through the DMV. And those are like 200 bucks a year. So by that. property tax, we're not necessarily meaning like the local county tax assessor property tax. Correct. It's right? different. We're, talk, uh, we're talking about a housing community development property tax. Yes. Right. Um, Even though it's the same name, we ain't talking about the same thing. Right? No, we're not talking about the same thing. And although it's very similar, and it, it comes out a couple times a year. But the, the fees on them are much less. The property taxes are based on the original sales price, not reset like you see on a single family home. It's a big thing, right? Because if we see this all the time, you do move up buyers from uh, their first home to their next home, the taxes kill them. And because the taxes rates what, one and a quarter percent on the new sales price, that's not the case here. These are the original, these taxes are based on the original sales price. I don't know if you noticed, but on that last slide, the tax or that title search I put up, the original purchase price on that home was $81,000. So the 81,000 becomes the tax base. It appreciates at 3% a year. So the taxes that they're paying on that home are gonna be based on that. They're not based on the purchase price, which I think was in that case about two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. A couple other nuances: you can't just have a, a non-occupying co-borrower. That's a, that can, that's a real problem. 
All borrowers must be on title. All borrowers must be approved by the park. And so you have to have both of those to get a loan. There is a carve out in the case of someone, an parent wanting to buy a home for their child, in which case we can get loans on those. Park approvals required, we've touched on that. No bankruptcy foreclosures on credit reports. Remember, these are portfolio lenders. They don't have to be uh, lenient on any of this stuff, and they're not. If you have a bankruptcy or foreclosure on your credit report reporting, you're probably gonna not going to get a loan through the primary guys. You're going to have to go to hard money, and then we're really talking fine interest rates. Must have a valid Social Security number, no ITM, no work restrictions like you would see on a, uh, like a work permit. That's bro, we talked about this. Um, all right. So what are some of the talking points you, you'll have to cover if you take this listing or you help somebody trying to buy one? Um, what are the financial advantages? It typically, it's a less dollar payment down. That's a big advantage for most people because around here, trying to save up the down payment is a huge problem. For a lot of your first time home buyers, here you're talking about 5%, and that can be a gift. It doesn't have to be in their own money. Um, if you run the numbers, and I did this a couple of times, you look at how much square footage of living space they get per monthly payment versus like a condo or a townhome, it's normally quite a bit more space for monthly house expense. And then the other thing, the talking point to remember is that the lower tax base can help offset the thought or the idea of those higher space rents. Because if you buy a condo or a townhome, you're going to have your taxes are going to be established based on that purchase price. Again, can roll the closing costs into the loan. So if they've got just barely 10% down, that's a good, we encourage them to do that because they can get a lower interest rate. Interest rates, yes, they are typically high. Um, typically, they run about 1% to 2% higher than your traditional 30-year fixed conforming loans, which I think those are running in the 65 to 6.75% range with no points today. And so you're looking, and there may be lower. I don't keep up on them day to day. But um, a manufactured home today, they run in the high 7 to 8% range. And if you're putting less than, if you're putting only 5% down, you're going to be talking in the 9% range. Um, but it's on a lower balance. So the payments uh, may be more equal to a 30-year fixed on a traditional home. And then the other question I always get is, is there, is there appreciation? You know, I'm just buying something like a car. It's going to depreciate over time. Around here, they appreciate. They tend to appreciate and track the, the normal market because housing is a high demand and there's a limited number of it, amount of it available. And so they do appreciate. I would put a caveat on that as long as they're well-maintained and they're updated. Uh, you walk into some of these older homes and they look like they were pulled in by somebody's Ford F-250. Um, you look at some of the older, other older ones where they've gone through and they've replaced all the walls, they've reconfigured, they've updated it. Um, it looks really nice. And that makes a big difference in the values and maintaining that uh, appreciation. So that's kind of what I had for the, uh, what other I got down here, rent control. I know I, think I mentioned that some of the parks have rent controls. Seeing that, it's a good thing uh, for a buyer. It helps them predict what's going to happen with their space rent. That has been a problem in the past. Yeah. And uh, that's all I have prepared. I'm glad cool. to answer any questions. All right, here's your chance. They've been questioning as we've been going along. So we're running up on, if somebody has a question, speak. Otherwise, um, what uh, my recommendation is, I get asked this question a lot, which is who does mobile home loans, right? Because my people have buyers, they wanna buy a mobile home. And so 
I really wanted to invite Dennis to come and explain how it all works so that you all now have a friend in the mobile home lending business, to, to borrow a phrase. Um, and if so, if you've got a buyer that's interested, it's probably a shorter run to let your buyer talk directly with Dennis and get the, the scoop on whether or not they're going to be able to buy one and what price range and all of that, and then take it from there. Yeah, I'd be glad to talk to any of them. And then what I make a point of doing is making sure you're informed when I do get these referrals, because I hate not getting knowing what's happening. <laughs> All right. Communication. All right. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Really appreciate it. Let me see. Do you finance uh, in all counties in California? Yes. All right. I have people all over the place. So the answer is yes. Most. All right. Cool. Thank you all for participating. Go out there and list some mobile homes, sell some mobile homes, particularly if you're on my team. I, I want to see you out there doing that. Thanks a lot, everybody, for participating. Talk to you all. I just, I just went into escrow on a mobile home today. Well, congratulations. Good deal. Yay. <laughs> awesome. All right. Nice one, one a week is all we ask. One a week. Okay. That's it. All right. All right. Thank See you. Guys. Bye. All right.